welcome to the Menopause and Cancer podcast, where we speak with cancer patients, survivors and incredible experts in their fields to help us find solutions to our symptoms and ideas to improve our health. My name is Danny Binnington and today we want to celebrate Leanne Perrault, the most amazing woman who's just gone on and received an MBE for her outstanding contributions to her community. Leanne is amazing. She's founded a charity called Black Women Rising and today I want to know from Leanne how and what moved her to champion such a cause and I want to really listen to Leanne's experience because I think I have so much to learn as a white woman in particular and I also want to know from Leanne how we can all go out there and champion ourselves a little bit more. Leanne's answer to this question is amazing. I hope it resonates with you as much as it resonated with me and I also want to know from Leanne how she almost started to take hormone replacement therapy after her own breast cancer diagnosis and how she ended up not going on it. It's a real story with many twists and turns. Leanne shows and shares openly. It's incredible to listen to her. And it's also a real story of how underserved women are in general. Women's health, we're so on the back foot. Leanne's example is one of many, and I'm grateful to share her story with you today. And she has gone on to do amazing things. Leanne, we are so proud of you. Thank you for being amazing and for being here with us today. Leanne, I'm here to celebrate you today and everyone listening oh. to our conversation is really Thank celebrating you. you for your latest achievements. Do you want to tell us what's Thank happened you. in your life last week? <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, I I was awarded an MBE from the King, so yeah, which is big deal. Amazing. I <laughs> saw you. all of the fantastic photos of you receiving. Oh, thank you. Your award. You're on ITV News. It was such yeah. a celebration, and I think one of the best things about our community is we're all so happy for each other, isn't it? Because yeah, <laughs> I was it, really yeah. happy for you. Thank you. I think I think what we realise about our community is that we've all been through really tough times. So I think it's just really nice seeing people turn that sort of pain into good and being recognised for it is a really lovely thing, I think. Yeah. And I think the call for today's podcast episode is I want to know lots about you and your journey and how you got to receive this amazing award, but also how we can champion ourselves because not everyone... Yeah needs to mm. be out there and set up charities and and do um, no. do things like that but i mm. really want to feel like we can all champion ourselves a bit more and how we can do that so i'd love to talk Absolutely. about that what is black women rising leanne so black women rising is a charity that i set up um a few years after my own diagnosis with breast cancer, which was seven years ago. So Black Women Rising is five years old now. Um, and it's a charity that focuses on empowering women of colour through their cancer diagnosis, but also offering like culturally sensitive support, information um, and advice for people who have been diagnosed and their families. But also we work on, you know, major brand campaigns with charities or brands around like diversifying literature, diversifying their offerings to people of colour going through cancer as well. Mm. And why did you think there was a need as a white woman who was diagnosed with cancer 10 years ago? I'm probably very oblivious that there is even a need um, for a charity mm. like yours. Tell me a little bit about that. Even me myself, you know, I was oblivious. My mum had had breast cancer twice before. You know, my mum's a mixed race woman. Um, we grew up in Norfolk, which was a which was a hugely sort of white dominating area. You know, we didn't really realise that there would be these differences when going through healthcare. We didn't. We ne we were completely mm -hmm. oblivious. Um, and six months before I was diagnosed, my mum was diagnosed with breast cancer for the second time. I nursed her through that. It was me and my mum by each other's sides going through that. Again, I was oblivious. It was when I had my diagnosis and I guess I was going through my own journey because me and my mum are very different. I started to meet a lot of other girls my age. And I started saying, seeing that number one, when you looked at the literature that was given to us or the posters on the walls in the hospitals there was nobody that looked like us <laughs> going through cancer um you know that definitely anything that we could relate to 
But when I started talking to a lot of these women on the wards, just hearing some of the reactions back from their community. So I know one of the very first things I was told um, by, you know, a friend, they said, oh, black people, I've never heard of black people getting cancer before, which I think is a huge thing, you know. Um, and then I guess the next thing that happened was, you know, a woman, a girl that was my age, she was told by her parents that she couldn't come and stay with them while she was going through cancer because they said to her to go back to where she caught the cancer from. And then there was just other wow. stories about religion and, you know, women that were being told not to tell family members because, you know, they'd been told that cancer's a curse, the things that they had done. So I then realized that, hold on, our experiences as people of color are very unique to our white counterparts. And it's not that there was a need to have like the segregated group. It wasn't necessarily even about race. It's just that the stuff that's happens culturally ingrained into our various different communities, because there are various different co communities amongst people of color. There are some really unhelpful belief systems that need to be demystified. Um, and in order for these women to feel like they can get through their diagnosis, they need their own separate space where they can all relate to each other, where there's a, fe f a feeling of fam familiarity, familiarity, that's the word, um, and they can yeah. all come together and relate to each other. And I think that's everyone's right, you know, on this earth is to have safe spaces. Um, so that's why I set it up. Wow. And, you know, I, I wonder what sort of myths everyone has uh, that is listening oh. to the conversation. However big or small they are, some people think they have to get through this on their own and they can't tell anyone until maybe after the active treatment finished. And some people want to talk about it from day one and they feel like if they don't talk about it, they're not being truthful. We all have these sort of sometimes weird expectations, isn't it? And I always felt people needed a safe space to talk about the menopause, for example, because the mm. normal menopause conversation mm -hmm. is also not right for us. Once you've had cancer, yeah. I never felt comfortable in all the normal menopause conversations. Yeah. I felt that needed a separate space. And it's good to create that safe space, like you say. Mm -hmm. Can I, I ask understand. you a little bit about what it was like to nurse your mother and then having been diagnosed with cancer yourself? Was it like you thought, this can't be right you're in the wrong movie yeah and yeah yeah odds? definitely what are the odds and, and and also as well like I've got four other sisters you know my background was in health and fitness you know I was I, I run a dance company I'd always danced all my life fit and healthy so for this to happen you know out of all four sisters do you know what I mean I was a bit like me you know it was a very yeah. very surreal and shocking moment I went into a lot of shock you know, I think for the first couple of months, that was the biggest problem was that I was I was experiencing a lot of anxiety, a lot of shock, a lot of shame. Why had my body failed me? What was what's going on? What's wrong with me? You know, and again, this was also fueled by the lack of representation that I saw when I was going through it. I felt like the only black girl at 30 years old with a breast cancer diagnosis. Yeah. Who were the first people you connected with then where you felt, oh, there's someone like me? Oh, 100 percent. It was the remember? women on the chemo ward. You know, as I saw more and more women of color, more and more people my age going through it. That was when for me that I started to see more and more representation. That's when I started feeling a lot more like, OK, this is not just me now. There are other people here. Hmm. And Leanne, can I ask you, how is your mum today? She's great. She's had cancer twice. She's thriving. She's healthy. She's well. She's great. So she's always a really good example for me to use with anybody, you know, especially all the women I work with now. I'm like, my mum's first cancer diagnosis before she had her second, they were, there was 24, 25 years apart. She went through chemo and everything. So it goes to show, like, you know, people are surviving this disease and people are getting through it and thriving from it as well. Mm. Do you feel you had to help your mum along when you were diagnosed after your own diagnosis or did you feel you needed to soothe and look after yourself? I mean, you were in a very caring responsibility towards your mum and then you had to start to care for yourself. What was that shift there? How did you think I'm going to navigate this? You only have so much energy, yeah. right? 
Um, I didn't have to continue caring for my mum because she only had a, a mastectomy. So I won't say only, but my mum's very strong. She's very stoic. She's from that sort of old and, you know, that old way of thinking. She's able to kind of handle herself, get on with things. I, I, she didn't have to have any other treatment afterwards. It was very, very different. And so I guess once I was diagnosed, it was like all hands on deck now, everyone to kind of look after me. So luckily I didn't have to worry about that, you know? Yeah. And and, and in your sisters and your community, did you speak openly mm -hmm. about it? Or did you have some of those hush hush myths or um that you felt no, you'd not hide amongst from it? My or... family. No, not amongst mm -hmm. my family. Like I said, we've got a very uh mixed cultured upbringing it's it's very very different i think amongst our family we're quite open about cancer cancer was in our family we knew it it, it was the outside world for us that was like whoa people's belief systems on cancer are just it's it's crazy out there like one of the things i remember when few few people found out i was diagnosed it, it was the messages that came through of all these you know concoctions of food and the vegan diets and all these other things you know this cures cancer if you take this it cures cancer and it's like do you know by sending me these things you're making me feel like I am to blame for my cancer you know like there's this kind of whole kind of like you know you, you need to go completely natural you need to do this don't take the chemo it's not for black people there's all of those kind of myths and taboos so Yes, I was up against that, but I know so many other women were as well. Mm. And when we look at general cancer survival rates uh, from how early people get diagnosed, women of colour are on the back foot, aren't they? I mean, the yeah, statistics are. aren't looking great. No, so black women are twice as likely to die from a breast cancer diagnosis than our white counterparts, usually at a later stage. Um, and are usually disproportionately affected by, you know, some of the more aggressive subtype, like triple negative, you know, breast cancer. Um, and it's not just breast cancer. I know it's other cancers as well. You know, people of colour are just disproportionately, um, you know, affected by, not necessarily affected, but diagnosed at a later stage. The mortality rates are higher. Um, and there's so many reasons for that, but What's very sad is, is is those mortality rates are higher for a lot more of the treatable cancers, you know, and mm. for me, that's where my work comes in around the awareness side, you know, normalizing conversation around cancer, making sure there's education mm. in these communities, it's meeting the communities where they're at, mm. but also working with other charities, other healthcare professionals about community engagement, you know, that's where we're going to start really changing these statistics is community engagement has to has to the community engagement has to be there but also the education as well around our needs and why our experiences are so unique you know I mean there is so much to unpack isn't it and one of the biggest questions I think I have now is how did you go from having this you know then the, the the understanding that there is this big gap, that you're in it, like you are and your mum, you were one of them, right? You realised, okay, this this stuff is happening out there. This is my experience. And mm. how can I improve it? What did you do first? What was the first thing you did? Did you get a group of mm -hmm. women of colour together and said, let's talk about this stuff? Or what did you do? Yeah, what was your first step exactly to where did. you are we... today? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it. I'll be honest with you. There's no formula, as I like to tell people, um, there was no formula, there was no plan to create a charity. The idea was that we just needed a safe space in a group. And I was in the best position to put that together because I was, I had set up a community business many years ago. I had places that I could get for, for, for basically nothing, you know, and I knew how to run and chair groups. So I guess it was, I was in the best place to do it. Um, and that's what we did. We, we set up a group and all these women that I was talking to, I brought them all together. So the first group we had, there was eight women, you know, and um, there wasn't a dry eye in the room um, when people were leaving. And then that's when I just knew that, that well, I was onto something, you know, and then they, those groups became every twice a month, well, once every other month, and then they became monthly and then all these other opportunities and projects came from there, you know, so yeah, it was like a, 
a very quick spiral, I will say. <laughs> yeah, and we will get to talk about, you know, your time with the king. And I really want to hear all about that. But what really lights my soul is just to get women together, right? As a yoga teacher, mm. when we take people on yoga yeah. retreats, for example, I yeah. know their magic that happens mm. mm-hmm. when a group of women comes together. And often the best times I had is when people don't come as best friends and you don't have groups of best Mm. friends when people step outside of their comfort zone and they almost Mm. come alone because they can really Mm. show up with who they are on that day not with who they think they need to be or what what their friends might expect them to be so they really show up much more I think authentic with their worries and also their joys of who they are so I think that's always amazing so if anyone is thinking to join um, a help group or is to join maybe the Moving Forward course with Breast Cancer Now or one of our Empowered Menopause programs or even our hike. You know, I know some people feel a little bit like, oh, I'm going to go on my own. Will I know anyone? Will I make friends? Will I be comfortable? Will I be accepted? What am I going to wear? There's all these reservations we have and it's amazing to break through them, isn't it? Because when you are then in this safe community, I think often when we go on yoga retreats, for example, the people are the proudest that have never been away on their own. They yeah, they didn't they know what to expect. Yeah. Then they do it. And then you're like, wow, this has been an amazing experience. And chemically, we know oxytocin in is released just when women get together. And it's a really feel good, happy hormone. And blokes don't have it. So I think we have a huge advantage. <laughs> and in the olden that days, you know, thousands mm. of years ago, women's circles that's how communities were created that's how politics were really created that's where a way of living was created so it's just fantastic to to do that you're so right what what can people of non-color do to improve our understanding because until you raised awareness i didn't I had no idea it was a thing. I had no idea there was any myths and misconceptions. It's not about racism like you explain. It's really about different communities doing things so differently. And being Austrian, I also know that things are very different. People talk about things differently. When I talk to my friends about menopause now, they're like, menopause what? Oh, no, no. Surely Mm -hmm. you just eat more healthily and go to the gym. And I'm like, well, no. (laughs) Hang on a minute. Exactly. <laughs> um, so culturally, it's a lot going on. Yeah. What can we learn? Like, what can people sort of on the outside of your community almost learn mm. from what's happened with your movement? I think it's a really, really good question, Danny. Because I, I, I've always said, listen. You know, in the last couple of years for me, particularly the first two to three, were quite scary. How much? when I spoke up about these things, how much abuse I got, you know, I I got death threats, you know, from people messaging me saying that I'm race baiting, making things up. I have a chip on my shoulder. um, I'm lying. I'm ungrateful to the NHS and all these things. And these are the things that I was getting. I was getting horrible racial language sent to me if I went and spoke on television or anything like that. It was scary. We we used to have to make sure we hired a PR firm around October, Black History Month and Breast Cancer Awareness Month, because I knew that's when we were doing a few more high profile things, but the abuse would come. And so it was a year, 2021, wow. it was when I was I was so ill from all the trolling. I, I was just so ill from it all. I got really depressed. And so I said, I'm never making that mistake again. And we just made sure we had things in place just to cover any problems and stuff like that. And that's why we're not on Twitter, for example, because that was where we were getting the most abuse. So we just became this mechanism of trying to like protect our voices. But anybody that's listening that wants to learn, I think it's about listening and learning about the stories and not judging, you know, like that to me is key because we, you know, I I am very aware, like it is a unique set of circumstances. We don't expect you to completely understand our experiences, but perhaps not judge and maybe just listen. I think that's what it's about. You know, that's what I think true allyship is about. It's not about sharing stories. It's not about sharing our messaging. I actually don't think it's based on that. That's part of allyship. But allyship is a feeling and it's a feeling of I understand this and I understand that these girls or these women's experiences are different. 
like I say, my favorite line is we may be one human race, but our lived experiences are not the same. So that means that we're not the same, you know, um, and that and I think you pulled up a really amazing um, uh, example there where you said, you know, you're from Austria and all of that. Every different people's set of communities are different and we find familiarity in our communities that's what we do it doesn't mean that we're not comfortable in any others but it means that when we come together with people who have grown up around us or from similar backgrounds or things like that we feel, feel a sense of familiarity and that doesn't exclude the black community you know ah gosh there's so much learning in here and you know one of the biggest the, the listening is great and I'm glad I'm here to listen to you today and I'm glad everyone on our show gets to listen to you today because one of where I can really share a huge part of ignorance from my behalf is that I'd never even assumed you would get any trolling or any backlash yeah. or any yeah. negative language for the work you do. I just think mm -hmm. it's amazing what you do. And Thank so you. how Thank ignorant you. of me to, to even yeah. think that you would just stand up there and go on television and for everyone to go bravo you. Well, clearly your experience is very different. And yeah. I can relate a little bit in, I have to be careful too in the language we use. I don't want to poo poo the NHS. I think most doctors are doing a great job. And at the Absolutely. same time, we know the majority of them do not talk about the menopause for those affected by cancer in how important it is. And it gets brushed under the carpet by some it gets addressed by others and they don't maybe have not the strategies to help their patients and so we are just where we are are and i want to just highlight that and say as it is and so yes there is criticism that comes our way but nowhere near to the effect you had it and so thank you for sharing that with us because of it's course. one thing yeah. to meet the king and receive such an amazing recognition and award and it's another thing to do this every single day and show up for your community knowing yes. that you will get negativity yeah. and it's not always going to be easy at all and no. it's the endurance that takes the energy isn't it it's not the time yes. where you get the award that's lovely everyone's celebrating yeah. you but it's every single day where you step out there it's exhausting were there times mm. where you felt exhausted with it all Leanne oh my god all the time <laughs> yeah all the time it's exhausting i mean you know it's i think i've learned so much in the last five years i think the one thing that keeps me going always is the the, the stories that come back of people's lives transformed and changed yeah. because the charity exists or when i get girls younger girls girls that were my age or younger coming and saying look I'm not going to lie. I've seen you. I've seen you really thrive after your diagnosis. So I know I'm going to be OK. Those are the real amazing things that I kind of live for. And those are the things, honest to God, that keep me going. Um, and also just seeing like the membership grow so much. You know, and we have now was definitely over 500. I think we're moving now. I found out yesterday we're moving to almost the 600 mark of members which shows like a, a small charity with a few staff members how much we're needed, you know, in this in this country, how much the safe space is needed. But yeah, you know, I, I won't lie and say it's exhausting. It's exhausting sitting in a room talking and knowing that most of those people that are going to walk out of there are going to go, she's making this up or what I say goes through one ear and out the other. It's exhausting. And I know mm. that's going to happen. Like there are mm. just some things now I just know. I know that when I go to talks or go and do this although I know that people are not going to understand you know I'm going to get some of the eyes rolling back at me I know that's the stuff that's going to happen so I mm. guess you know I think my my biggest thing always to say to people is I do it because I I see the outcomes and I've also learned to kind of package the charity up in a way where our members and all the staff team including myself are safe you know, so there's now certain work that I just don't do. Like, I'm not very interested in political campaigning or anything like that. Like, I know my safe space and I know what this charity is about. And it's about empowering the women who are going through a cancer diagnosis. That's my specialism. I try not to do much more than that. I'm not interested in a lot of that. Talk to me a little bit about the members. So for anyone listening who's thinking, wow, I want to connect with Leanne and mm -hmm. her community. How does it work? How do, how do people connect? Sure. So they can drop us an email, but um, most people go through our website, which is www.blackwomenrisinguk.org. 
Um, and uh, there's a, an amazing form on there that you can fill out. And as soon as you fill that out, someone will contact you within seven days to book you in for a members talk, which we do on Zoom, which is a one to one talk about your needs. And that allows us to then pinpoint people to the various services that we have. We've got coffee mornings, supper clubs, um, nurse support line. We have events. Uh, we have online support groups. Uh, we have courses. I mean, we have a lot of things happening. So there's always something for someone um, and it's really exciting. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. And now talk to me about your MBE and how all of that came about <laughs> and meeting the king. I cannot wait to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up not meeting the king because obviously he's still recovering from his own cancer diagnosis. But I met equally as amazing uh, Prince William and um, he was fantastic and we had an amazing amazing chat um, about my work and he was just lovely and really like you know you can see that he does like he must look at the guests that are coming in and you know maybe a bit about each of us and kind of there's that kind of familiar feeling so yeah he's lovely and friendly and warm um, and he, you know, when I spoke to him a little bit about the charity, he was like, I'd love to learn more, you know, I'd, I'd love to, to learn a bit more about it. So who knows, you know, I think even him himself was ignorant to some of the experiences that we go through. So I mm -hmm. think that that was just a really beautiful thing. But it was such a beautiful day. One day that I think you'll never forget in your whole lifetime. You know, it was beautiful. Going to Windsor Castle, stunning, beautiful castle. Um and just the whole day being with like my mom and my sister and yeah it was just a really really beautiful day one that I'm still not coming down from as yet and then I got to go obviously on Monday to um, ITV News took my medal spoke to them so it's just been a really lovely day to reflect and I guess it was letters from the community um, that um, managed to get me the um, MBE which is amazing um, and I've now sort of found out that uh, someone had been gathering letters for three years. So it's insane. Yeah. So it took three years to come through. I was like, no way. Three years. Yeah. So that was that, is, um, that was amazing. Oh, that is absolutely amazing. And, you know, you looked amazing. You had your red jacket on. You wore your black trousers with your really cool trainers. I just thought, wow. <laughs> you know, such a celebration of everything you've been through, everything your family's been through, all the amazing yeah. people you've helped. What I wanted to get at to, towards the end of our conversation is the championing, you know, that feeling that you champion other people, that you champion, champion yourself, that you stand up for a cause that is important to you. And that cause doesn't need to be on the outside and creating communities or creating charities or even fundraising you know I, I really don't believe everyone needs to be out there raising money for charities and walking the desert and climbing Mount Everest and doing all these things or I'd love for people to join us on our fundraising walk because I know it's a great a great opportunity to bring community together it's a wonderful yeah. time to connect to get out of your comfort zone to feel that you've achieved something and just to have another life experience so I'm all yeah. up for it but how can we champion some of what you have created for ourselves because in essence that's what's important isn't it there's you know over 20,000 people listening to our conversation this month alone and I'm thinking we've all gone through so much every single person listening to us have had their own life shock they've had their own insults to their injuries whether that's because menopause came along or whether that's because they feel excluded from the greater conversation maybe they're women of color and they feel not heard wherever they live not seen by their families how can we champion some of that for ourselves you know do you know what it's a really good question and it's one that I think there's no one size fits all because I think to champion yourself you have to be in a good headspace to do that you know it's like it's like that saying right you know and 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 it's 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 a it's a difficult saying, but it's very true. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't force them to drink. There's that saying, right? Have you heard of that? Mm. Yeah. 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 My, my, th and I think 
you know, there's, there's, there's so much essence about my work that is absolutely incredible, but it does not suit all. What about those who actually can barely, this, you know, they've had a diagnosis and they're, they, bar- they, they can barely even um, show up for themselves, you know, uh, and get out of bed in the morning, you know, let alone come down and connect with a charity like ours. So my, my advice always to everybody, and this is one thing that I... I, I, I blanket blanketly talk to everyone about is around the art of speaking and talking up and therapy and starting there. I think that therapy is something that is such is an isn't is it available to everybody, even though there might be wait lists and things like that. I think therapy is something that has enabled so many of us, especially people of colour and, and people that are in my community to be able to break out of generational trauma and generational cycles of pain. And I think that the the therapy allows people to kind of start looking at things that they never thought were possible, such as putting themselves first. Something that's really deeply ingrained into like the black community is around, we do not come first. The women of the household do not come first. Everybody else has to be looked after first and women are usually last and are the ones that kind of make sure everyone else is okay. So when lots of these women are being diagnosed, the art of actually putting themselves first just to even recover from chemo or an operation is is alien to them. And it's about undoing that kind of belief system. So for me, there's a lot of facets here. Championing yourself can... I believe only be done when the mind starts connecting with the feeling, you know, and for me, a lot of times that needs, you need to start speaking that out with someone and need to start talking through where some of those belief systems come from. So yeah, I guess that's my spin on that. I I, I would be, I'd feel like a fraud if I was on here and I was like, yeah, just take that step and really believe in yourself. I I can't say that because I don't think that it works like that. I think you've got to, especially like when I think about my own journey, getting over my own traumatic experiences that I've been through in life, therapy was a huge starting point for me for where my life changed, where I started to believe in myself, where I started to feel empowered enough to even be able to create something like Black Women Rising. So, and I know now a lot of these women who now champion the work that I do are women who have gone through that cycle as well. I've got women at 50, 60 years old completely reinventing their lives because they found a safe space, whether it's talking amongst our women or talking to one of our wonderful nurse support lines or something like that. And they're now completely reinvented themselves, understand about putting themselves first, exercising for the first time in 50 years you know there's this amazing transformation happens when you start speaking up and working through that trauma and things that you're going through I think that's amazing because you know when you speak when you hear our conversation it's all about how can you empower yourself to mitigate some of your symptoms of the menopause right it's about okay using a multifaceted approach I wax lyricals everyone listening to me is probably going to think okay she's going to tell us to (laughs) to be the empowered patient to go to our doctors to to be the difficult patient to get an appointment there's non-prescribable hormonal options talk about hormonal options talk about vaginal health talk about complementary therapies then talk about exercise and diet all these things cannot happen if you don't believe you're worthy of that time and energy and effort and that is what you're saying isn't it so before we can even move into action exactly and and you know something Danny as well a lot of the um the black and brown communities especially that are so governed by religion there's a lot of shame around women's health you know so that you know symptoms that they may be experiencing of the menopause which we know is just so common after cancer even me myself with all my hormonal issues and things like that like there's a lot of shame before they even step up to be able to go and talk about these things and I think that is where the 
for me is is around kind of like the undoing of a lot of the belief systems and that only can happen in safe spaces to talk so yeah i i'm glad we're on the same page with that it's 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 a huge thing it's a huge thing yeah um your own menopause experience was really mm. messy and mm. you were at your wits end at one point and thinking all I can do is maybe have some HRT because I'm feeling so rubbish, yeah. right? Yeah. Can you talk us through a little bit of that? And then I also want to touch, touch on thyroid a little bit because it really winds me up that women's health is so neglected. And I know people who haven't been back to their general practitioner in years and years and years after their cancer diagnosis. And for whatever reason, we sort of disconnect from the hospital setting. We disconnect from oncologists and surgeons at one point and then we're out there on our own and no one helps us look after our bone health our metabolic health and we know it's massively impacted by it's our state impacted. of hormones yeah tell me a little bit of what's happened with you yeah so it was literally after like i said in 2021 um it was definitely after a really busy black history month and stuff i had a bit of a nervous i always call this a little bit of a nervous breakdown i my mental health just went into this i had a really awful episode of just like panic attacks anxiety attacks and i went to the doctor and i said look there's something severely wrong because i can't eat i feel really and he was just like oh i'm gonna sub subscribe you antidepressants and I'm like I've gone through depression before it's not felt like this there's something going on in my body um, my hair's falling out um, I had really really bad headaches um, and my periods just stopped um, and I knew that that was something that could happen after cancer bearing in mind at this time I was about four years cancer free um, three four years and I was like um, you know I, I this this is just came suddenly there was no symptoms or build up there's something a bit wrong so my mum kept saying maybe your thyroid might be off I've got thyroid problems you know da, 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 da. so I went to the doctors back again I mean I kid you not Danny but by the time I decided to not go to them and go private I'd probably been to the doctors about five or six times with various different blood tests and one of the blood tests did show that my thyroid was a bit off but not enough to treat me by that time, I hadn't had a period in seven months. You can imagine my hair was falling out in clumps. Um, mood swings were horrendous. I'd, I'd never, I, I, I was just consistently living on edge. I was a nightmare for people around me um, and, and everything. Um, I, I was, productivity was very, very low. Um, awful, I've never suffered with migraines in my life awful, awful headaches and migraines are consistently just on paracetamol, um, tired, bones aching, like crying, getting out of bed, you know, because I was in so much wow. pain. And um, I just went privately um, to a GP and um, she was talking to me and she said, well, um, I don't even need to do uh, blood tests because he's done them already. I can see the results here of all the blood tests. There's no point me repeating it again. Menopause isn't something that you diagnose by a blood test. It's usually done clinically amongst you, yourself and your doctor. And I can see here that you are probably perimenopausal considering your health profile and da, 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 da. So I'm going to subscribe you some HRT and blah, blah. And I was like, oh my God, you know, HRT, me. 30 I think I was 36 at the time and I was like oh my god anyway um so she did and something told me not to take it I said I'm not ready to take this yet because I don't know if it is go on I'm gonna I need to interrupt here yeah, um, go for sorry it. Yeah. about that when yeah. you had your cancer treatment um and you had chemotherapy uh, and that puts you into temporary menopause, sometimes yeah. ovarian function recovers. What were your conversations with your oncologist about hormone replacement therapy? Were you one of the no, people no, that said no, we you've had breast cancer? Okay. So what did no, you know nothing. about HRT after breast cancer? Did you think, you know, that people sometimes think I can never, ever touch hormones. Some other people think maybe it's an option further down the line. What did you think or know? Um, I think from my own research and understanding that I did, I always said with HRT, if I needed to take it, I would, but I knew that, that it, it would come with risk. Um, and that was, that was always my opinion of it. I, I was quite informed about HRT before this conversation came to my 
um, vision because of the work that I do, not necessarily because my doctors or anybody told me about it. Hell no. You know, the healthcare professionals that were around me at the time never spoke about it at all. Bearing okay. in mind as well, at the same time, all of this was going on, the doctor said, we'd like to get like a scan to, you know, just check your ovaries and everything else like that. And when I got put on to the appointment, my appointment was six or seven months away. So it's a six or seven month wait list. Okay. So then this private doctor says, okay, we'll start your HRT. You were prescribed mm -hmm. um, hormone replacement therapy, medication. You walked away thinking, that's it. I'll be sorted. I'm going to try this. It comes with risks, but I'm happy to take them. I understand I'm making mm -hmm. a decision, right? Like people mm -hmm. make decisions all the time. What happened then? Mm -hmm. I really, really trust my gut, right? And I said, I don't think I'm in early menopause. I, I, I think I had gone through, it was by that time, it was about eight, nine months, probably longer. And I said, I actually think, along with my mum as well, I was like, I actually think it's my thyroid. Every symptom that I had pointed towards an underactive thyroid rather than perimenopause. I did so much research by that time. And like I said, I had no problem if I needed to take it. I know some women who have got so desperate, they started taking it and it's completely changed their lives. And there are people that have had breast cancer. I've seen that. Yeah. So I had no problem taking it if I needed to, but I wanted to rule out the underactive thyroid. So by that time I'd started acupuncture on a weekly basis, my period started to return. My headache started to ease. It was completely life transforming for me acupuncture but gave me a bit more of a clear head to start making quite informed decisions and also not rush into taking this drug anyway by the time I had done that I went back to the doctors twice for blood tests so I did my first blood test and he said come back in three months time your thyroid has gone a little bit more off by the time I went back in December and finally saw my family doctor who has been in my family for years because I hadn't been able to get an appointment for him for ages. I did a blood test and he called me back within two days and he said, yep, 100%, you've got an underactive thyroid. The two levels have now come, you know, they're out of range. We're putting you now on, you know, levothyroxine or whatever it's called. And then, um, you know, went on to, the, to, to that. And uh, I don't know, I think by that time it was a year. And I think I sat on my stairs, actually, <laughs> behind me. I sat on my stairs and I cried because I was like, this is what I had been saying for years. I know I'm not in the, the perimenop perimenopausal stage. I Yes, I was experiencing a lot of textbook symptoms, but we know it's such a grey area. But I knew for me that wasn't where I was at. I had it in my gut because particularly because my mum has it and also my sister has it. So... Yeah, it was so frustrating. Okay, so you started the thyroid medication and then what? Mm. Six weeks later, <laughs> I think it was six weeks later, I couldn't believe how I felt. Like, I couldn't believe it. There was a complete difference to how I felt. I'm mm. not usually one as well to take, like, I'm very holistic. I have a holistic approach to health. Very much so. I always have, you know, from, from my, my health and fitness days, I, I have a very holistic approach to health and quite active and, and, you know, just of always, like I've always had like, you know, my little lotions and potions and, you know, I take a lot of supplements. I do a lot of things to sort of aid myself and stuff. And I was worried about taking this pill and, um, this, and then when I saw the size of it, I was like, okay, all right, I'm going to try it. I'm going to do this. And I kid you not, six months later, the bone pain, six weeks later, bone pain went. I started feeling so level-headed. Like I wasn't lashing out like mentally. I wasn't feeling down anymore as much as I was. There was this kind of like balance restored. Um, and I couldn't believe the difference in how I felt. And I was still doing my acupuncture and everything else like that. But I also had a proper period as well, which was like, oh my God. Um, 
and that little pill every day, I guess, for me, just changed everything for me. I felt like myself again. And weirdly, everyone around me was like, I'm not going to lie, you seem more like yourself. For the last year, I, I haven't recognised mm. that person who was there. And my hair started to grow back as mm. well. That was another thing. My hair started to grow back as well. So, yeah, it was all these little things that I was seeing. And you know what's so great? The fact that we're both no doctors and we can really talk about those experiences, yeah. right? Because, you know, a GP might say, well, if your levels aren't below the normal range, and we know that normal range isn't a number, that starts at a number at the bottom and the, the higher number at the top. And if you're within <laughs> that normal, for most people, you're normal. And so if your range or your levels weren't below the normal, they might think, of course, we're not going to give this patient um a medication for her thyroid she's not below the level but what's so interesting is we're not levels as people we're not in the normal range you were in the lower part of that range and it wasn't good enough for you and it was throwing you it was derailing you and no one was really trusting you because the markers weren't quite where they should be to medicate a person and so it's really really important isn't it to trust our gut instinct. And a little bit of that, I was very much losing with my cancer diagnosis. I totally, in the beginning, I handed everything over to the medical system, mm. everything. It was like, have me, have me and do mm. to me, treat me, help me survive. And mm. it took a long time to shift that and to regain mm. and reclaw a little bit of that mm. power and control. And and I don't know for anyone thinking, well, I haven't had my thyroid levels checked. Maybe, maybe you should. Yeah, <laughs> maybe we should have our I thyroid everybody. levels checked. Tell everyone. What about our cholesterol everybody. levels? What yeah. about our bones? And mm -hmm. and yes, we can't always push and push and push, but we can try when we have a little bit of that energy because your example Absolutely. is amazing. Um, yeah. And also, you know, there is no right or wrong in having HRT prescribed, but also you went through a real journey. It's a journey, isn't it? Yeah. Like, it's like, wow, it's a project. To make decisions is hard work. I feel... Every health decision I've ever made requires a lot of emotional labor. And at the end of it, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Same. Yeah. yeah. It's um, so right. I wanted, I really wanted to highlight that because what's so important to show is, yes, you've collected this amazing award and you've done so much for your community. And at the same time, you're also navigating your own shit. Mm, yes. <laughs> Excuse my language. <laughs> yes. And your own Love menopause. It. And you yeah. and you have your own stuff to sort out. Like all of us, right? Mm. We are so much more mm. than the one thing. Um, yes, we are. But you're thank right. you for everything you do. And thank you for letting thank us you. listen today, Thank you, Danny. Leanne. Really appreciate the safe space to talk. Thank you. And um, can't wait to watch and see what comes next for you. Thank you. What a celebration today's conversation was. Leanne is amazing. The things she's gone on and achieved are absolutely amazing. She so deserves this MBE recognition. And I also think everything she told me really got me thinking about my ignorance, about knowing so little about other people's experiences. Like I know so much about what you might be experiencing at home, navigating menopause after a cancer diagnosis. But then there are so many other groups and subgroups with their own experiences where I haven't got a scooby-doo of what these experiences are. But I love listening. I love connecting to women in particular. And I love just having open ears and open eyes to all of your experiences. So if you want to share your experience with us, you can email us, maybe come onto the podcast and share your experience because likelihood that someone else is feeling in a similar way to you are really, really high. We just mustn't feel we're on our own with everything. And now let's all champion ourselves a little bit more. Like Leanne was saying, it starts with us. Maybe therapy, maybe um, talking therapy, maybe cognitive behavior therapy, maybe something like that resonated with you maybe you've gone on your journey already but what I loved about Leanne is when she said that change that championing starts with talking and speaking and voicing and maybe changing our belief systems that is so empowering I've got goosebumps and I hope we can all do a little bit more of that as the weeks and months and years go by and with that I'm championing you and I'm championing Leanne and I think it's amazing to be here I'm very grateful 
having spoken to such a brilliant woman. And I can't wait to talk to you on the show next week. Remember, we have a few spots left for our walking challenge. So if you're listening to this podcast recording live and it is July 2024, then join us for our big walk in Oxfordshire or set your own challenge and walk wherever you are. We haven't got many spaces left, so you've got to be quick if you want to join us. Um, I'd love to walk with you, connect with you and really get the conversation going. I put everything in the show notes as as always and chat to you next week. Mm-hmm.